Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you decided to join us. We're following the Sabbath School lessons being used by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first quarter of 2012. And this is lesson number 12 in that series on the glimpses of our God. Lesson number 10. I'm sorry, lesson number 10, the promise of prayer. Before we begin, let's bow our heads together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and all that it has meant to us and could mean to us. Help us to understand it better as we spend this time together so that perhaps with your encouragement and with help of the Holy Spirit, we may pray more effectively and make our lives more directly in line with the power that you promised to pour out even in the latter rain is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the role of prayer in the Christian's life? It gets you what you want. Gets you what you want, okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> we have been told repeatedly, not only through Scripture, but also through the writings of Ellen White, that the three major ways in which we grow our Christian experience are through Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. How would you describe your prayer experience? Does God answer your prayers? Well, well, how does it help your experience? I mean, the prayer. Whether well, it answers it or not, how would it? You want me to give the whole summary of the whole lesson in a couple of sentences, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, can't you just uh, give the gist uh, real quick? <laughs> Some well, answers so, are more obvious than others. Yes. Let's, let's just say that if faith is a relationship by which we are saved, <clears throat> and that faith relationship means being a friend of God, then if we're really friends of God, th there needs to be some kind of two-way communication. God needs to speak to us through the scriptures, and we need to speak to back to God through prayer. Is there, is there any more intimate connection that one can have with God than prayer? How more intimate do you, would you like it? I don't know. I'm just asking if there, if there was any more. I, I mean, think, it's, 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 um, I can think of some other things where God can touch your life. Uh, it's kind of one way, though. Mm -hmm. And this, if prayer is, is, is done right, it's a two-way thing. You are... You are. You may. You may not be saying. You can pray without saying words. It's. Yeah. It's a. It's a thought thing that's happening. That's what, here. That's what we've got to talk about here. But I think, do, do you I have think, to kneel down to pray? No, well, not necessarily. You could, but one thing is that when you when you pray, you put what you think into words, which which focus in on your thoughts, mm -hmm. and then when things actually turn out the way they do, well, then you can come back and compare, and you mm -hmm. can learn that way, mm -hmm. too, about God. Well, some very bright soul once described prayer as practicing the presence of God. Would, would that be equal to 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, where it says, pray without ceasing? Practicing mm -hmm. the presence of God. God can be around when you're not praying. Yeah. I, th I think getting back to Jay's question, I think there's maybe one more step of intimacy when you think of Daniel and he's praying and then Gabriel's right there. Mm -hmm. Some of the older prophets. I think that's, a that's even closer again in a more direct sense. Is, is prayer and study, is that different when you're thinking about God and praying about Him? Are those two different things? Well, the question is, you're thinking about God. Is, does God have any direct input in that? I would say Bible study, for me, reading from the writings of Ellen White also would qualify. We're getting input now from God. Isn't this where the Holy Spirit comes in? Sure. Yeah. Sure. But you know, if, you, if you're sitting there spending time asking questions even to yourself and pondering these questions, yeah. is, isn't that kind of a, a, a prayer too, to yeah, get the sure. answers sure. to that? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Now, you're saying your input from God was reading the Bible and reading Ellen White. Mm -hmm. um, is that opposed to people sitting and praying and believing that they're hearing a voice 
I mean, sometimes that voice can just be their own mind telling them, or sometimes it can be God. Well, you know, I, I, I'm a health professional. I'm a physician. I deal with a lot of people who hear voices. What yeah. they usually hear is not very uplifting. Too cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or if they hear something that tells them to do something that the Bible says is not good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of tricky when you say yeah. God will talk to you. Well, Paul, Paul had a very intimate experience on the road to Damascus. He heard God's <laughs> voice. Blowing with a baseball bat. You know, and so on and so forth. That, but that wasn't prayer. And, and prayer is different than that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there was a response. Well, let's, let, let, but that's, why, that's one of the things I want to get into <coughs> first in this discussion of prayer. How does prayer work? Now, let's, let's talk about this. You've probably all heard somebody say at some time or another, when I pray, it seems like my prayers never reach higher in the ceiling. Does that ever happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And what does that mean? Well, it, it, it happens when you have a preconceived idea what should happen. And it just doesn't look like it's going anywhere that direction. So you know, what they're implying is that God doesn't hear their prayer, prayer, but indeed God is present everywhere. He's present here. Yeah. So if our prayer is doesn't don't reach the ceiling, the ceiling, it doesn't have to go. It doesn't have to go beyond, beyond the ceiling. ceiling. God is here. Well, but what they're really saying is that... Uh, they don't get the answers they want. You know, some, they're not getting a connection that they feel. They're looking for something there that isn't... Mm -hmm isn't happening and sometimes I think it's an answer you know I want this and it it doesn't happen but I think there are, I think there are other people who express that who somehow they're they're wanting some kind of a presence that they're not experiencing and my only response to that is is um, from a very limited viewpoint, not being an authority on this kind of thing, my only response for that is, you know, it's uh, you. You can carry on a conversation with somebody you don't know very well, but the more you get to know that person, the deeper the intimacy and the sen the greater the sense of identity. Well, you want you want some sort of indication that somebody's hearing you, and sometimes there's no indication. Mm -hmm. This and in the '60s, this Leary guy. Uh, told you to take LSD and you would have a wonderful prayerful experience and you would get all the reinforcement you wanted through the feelings you were having. Mm -hmm. So does prayer involve feelings or does it involve the intellect or what are the mechanics of prayer? Well, I know a lady who keeps a prayer journal faithfully writes everything down. Mm -hmm. I mean di different people have Prayer is not really defined. What what exactly is prayer? Is it a feeling? Is it well, a journal? Is it let, a let's let's look at some examples from Scripture. Okay. Um, how is the Holy Spirit involved, for example, in prayer? Romans eight twenty six has these words: In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. Now that seems to be the question here. We're not quite sure <laughs> what this is all about. The Spirit Himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. Well, what does that mean? It sounds like the Spirit helps us plead in groans to God. Okay. To, um, How does that to work? What, if, if your groan isn't groany enough, God doesn't hear? Well, it's got, it's got to make the impression. It's got to, it's got to do the communication somehow. And and so God sometimes you sit down and you want to pray, and you and you don't even know what to say, but you you feel like there's something I got to say, but it just can't come out. That's a troubling verse. A troubling verse. Yes, yeah. so that sounds like there's this a great deal of labor intensive, almost technical and mechanical stuff that has to be carried out here and forth for God to hear our prayers that's, and that's what I'm asking you about. If we look elsewhere, the role of the Holy Spirit is to inspire the scriptures, mm -hmm. which is God talking to us. Mm -hmm. But apparently he has some role also in, in our lives. Talking back. Well, here's a paragraph that might be helpful. This comes from Steps to Christ, page 94. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us the fullness of his blessing. 
He wants to give us the fullness of his blessing. So that's why the Holy Spirit has to go through all this groaning stuff. Well, listen, bear with me. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless love. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children, and yet there is much manifest reluctance on our part to make known our wants to God. Well, what can, uh, and I read on. We make them on our wants. Yeah. I think Sometimes he responds by letting us know some of his wants. I see. And you, that's not so much fun. I think a big part of the trouble for us <laughs> in this world is we don't do it enough. When you yeah. equate that as against Christ going out all night, I can't conceive of praying all night. I just can't. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's the other end of it. So, so what, can what, it. what can the angels, I'm reading on, what can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who are subject to temptation when God's heart of infinite love yearns toward them? ready to give them more than they can ask or think, and yet they pray so little and have so little faith. The angels love to bow before God. They love to be near Him. They regard communion with God as their highest joy. And yet the children of earth, who need so much help, so much the help that God only can give, seem satisfied to walk without the light of His Spirit, the companionship of His presence. Step to Christ, page 94. Wow. Is, is she saying there that um, we're not careful about our connection with God, or is she, talking about, like, is she talking about that we're not doing it? Well, because I can tell you by experience, prayer can be worries. It can be pretty um, tiring. Mm -hmm. I think it can be, can very be tiring. <clears throat> I think it can be depressing when uh, you're pleading and moaning and groaning, and you don't seem to get answers, and you don't get answers. The person dies, the, um, and so, I don't know, I, I tend to... Okay. Uh, Here, here's, here's the challenge. I'm going to try to put this into words that we all can understand. Is the purpose of prayer to get, to ch to, to get God to change? It shouldn't be. That certainly is the purpose of some people's prayer. We should That's changed. what they would like to have happen. Well, the second, isn't what it should be. the second choice is this. <clears throat> is the purpose of prayer to change the world around us? It could be. Well, no, what's, what's the be. meaning of the word supplication? Well, it, it, means, it means you're trying to convince somebody to do something, mm -hmm. isn't it? And don't, isn't that a, a, a word that's used a lot when we go yeah. come to God yeah. in it's supplication? Got, it's got an overtone, though, for reverence, mm -hmm. putting yourself below, respectful. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's one um, of those multi-meaning words, I think. Yeah. I wish I had, uh, uh, can remember uh, uh, where it was that I read this in the past couple of weeks, but it was a comment about uh, getting what you want in prayer or what you think you need and it's by Ellen White and she says take your take your prayers to God and if you don't get it you keep going basically this is what she says you keep going back until your prayer is answered now now I'm phrasing it in a rather selfish <laughs> and yeah. a rather selfish way but she says keep going back until believe your prayer and keep going back until it is answered. Okay, let's, let, let's, let me give you the third possibility. I've given you two possibilities now. The third possibility is that prayer is to change us. So review the three possibilities. Okay, then. are we trying to change God? Are we trying to change the world around us? Are we trying to change ourselves? Well, and, and maybe I shouldn't say, are we trying to do it? If we really engage in true, honest prayer, what is the result? Where does, where does Jesus' um, parable come in where, you know, the, the unjust... Um, yeah. I mean, how, where does that... Where does that how does well, that... Okay, fit, let, where he said, talk keep about, going, yeah. keep asking. I, I was going to talk about that a little later, but let's talk about it right now. Let's, you know, he said, here's this unjust judge, and this widow keeps 
asking for her rights, asking for her rights, asking for her rights, and she knows what her rights are. And finally, what happens? The judge got tired of the, her. The asking. judge gets tired of messing with her, so he gives her her rights. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So why would Jesus tell such a... I mean, is he trying to say that's the way God is? Unjust? No. Unjust? No. What well, is he there's trying a to point to it? That's for sure. What is his point? Well, how many times do you make your kid ask before you give him something? I mean, that sounds kind of rough. It depends on how. And there's a lot. What it is? There's yeah. a lot of kids that just keep asking till their parents give in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it's for good things, that's hopefully only once. If it's for something they shouldn't have, hopefully you don't give in. Yeah. Well, probably. Far more than it is true, it should be true that prayer is for the purpose ultimately of changing us, making us more aware of what God's will is for our lives, and so that we can follow His plan for our lives, not, please, God, please follow me with my plan for my life. No, it should be finding out God's plan. And that rates us, of course, who is the best example you can think of of prayer? Jesus. Which well, certainly it ought to be Jesus, right? Uh, can you think of some times when Jesus prayed and what the results were? He asked for the cup to be taken from him and it wasn't. Okay, you're already jumping to the end of the story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, at the beginning of his ministry, he came up out of that water and he prayed to the Father. And I don't know how long the prayer was, but it was fairly short apparently. And what happened? Oh, came down. A dove came down representing whom? The Holy Spirit, and a voice was heard from heaven representing whom? Father. 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 I mean, here's a little tiny short prayer, and there's an entire trinity response. Do you know I what mean, the prayer was? No, no, we don't really. We don't know what the prayer was. I don't think if we prayed it, it would get the same results. But, <laughs> uh, there's a, I think it's reasonable to assume in this particular situation that that response was more than just for Jesus. It was for the surrounding, for John the Baptist and everybody around. And I'm assuming other people heard that voice too. In Luke 6, verses 12 and 13, let's just look at that. Maybe you're not, not going to believe me when I tell you what it says unless I read it to you. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. Carrie, this is your verse. Well, there's other <laughs> verses, but this is... When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he named apostles. So he is getting ready to launch his ministry, really, in full, in full, full steam, full, you know, all court press. He says, okay, the time has come for me to choose these 12. We're going to go forward. We're going to evangelize Galilee as much as we can. And he, he, he was so concerned that this come out right that he spent the entire night before praying. He was asking, was he asking for wisdom? That's what I want to ask you. What was, what was he praying for? And your criteria Strength. that prayer changes us, when Jesus went up to pray all night, did he pray that so it would change him? Well, and that's, that's what I, that's my, my uh, you're, you're jumping to conclude, I mean, you're jumping ahead of me here. That's my <laughs> question. What's happening here? Well, let's, let's take a couple more examples yeah. so that we, we, we get sort of a span across his ministry. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took those three disciples up there. They fell asleep. He's praying. And what's the result? Moses. Heaven and comes God. down. All of a sudden, whoa, there's this bright light. And they're looking up at this, you know, heaven revealed. I mean, God reveals himself. Is it possible that that sort of thing happened on a regular basis, and we just don't know about it. Well, when, when we, in response to Gary's question there, when we think about, you know, did, did this change Jesus in any way, our, our natural inclination is to think, well, he's God, and he doesn't need any help, and, and those kinds of things. But, you know, there was a human side to this, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe he did need uh, strength. You know, yeah. what, what was it when he, he needed something from the disciples that time on the Mount of Transfiguration? He came down and he came, you know, couldn't you just 
I mean, Garden of Gethsemane, you're talking Right, about. yeah. Couldn't, couldn't you just yeah. pray with me a little while here? That, that's, that was my next, que next place. We don't have time to read the whole passage. Matthew 26, 34 to 44. In the Garden of Gethsemane, and what happens? It's very interesting to note that Jesus went, de went down, and certainly none of us would say Jesus didn't know how to pray. And he prayed three times, very earnestly, to the point he's sweating drops of blood. And the answer was what? No. no. But generally, he got a strength and a clarity out of prayer. Yeah. And one wonders he ha how young he was when they, he first started doing that. We, we hear it mostly from adulthood, but I think you've mentioned this in some of your classes. He, this must have been going on for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Jesus had to have quite a strong prayer life and connection with God to be able to accept that no and do what he had to do. Well, so apparently Jesus got refreshment like we get of sleep through prayer. Yeah. And, and through, is it Jesus possible? through prayer got the refreshment that we get from sleep? Same is plus. it possible that Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit planned every day in advance? It's possible. Maybe we'll find out if we get to the look, kingdom. <laughs> look, at these, look at these words. Why do you think Jesus spent so much time in prayer? There are suggestions that he frequently spent long periods or even entire nights. We've looked at that already. Have you ever tried to do that? Apparently, Jesus came forth from those times of prayer refreshed as if he had been sleeping all night. What was the secret of his prayer life? And now I will quote from Ellen White. This is Gospel Workers, page 256.1. The Savior loved the solitude of the mountain in which to hold communion with his Father. Through the day, he labored earnestly to save men from destruction. He healed the sick, comforted the mourning, called the dead back to life, and brought hope and cheer to the despairing. And yeah. suffered exhaustion yes. in, his, in his human capacities. Yes. After his work for the day was <clears throat> finished, he went forth evening after evening away from the confusion of the city and bowed in prayer to his father. Frequently, he continued his petitions through the entire night, frequently. But he came from these sessions of communion with invigorated and refreshed, braced for duty and for trial. But now, not, does not that every happen night. with anybody else? No. Well, I'm and asking you, you if you had the kind of relationship. Well, look at they, they, Jesus had his disciples come up a couple times and ask them to pray, and they just fell asleep. Mm -hmm. So. They didn't do it. Excuse for us. That well, I'm just trying to trying to ask the question: Is can that type of prayer that acts like sleep actually happen to people? And if so, show me a, an example of that, even in the scriptures. You know that I, I can remember a couple of um, spiritual um, activities or experiences that I had that that kept me up at. Yeah, I don't know if it was all night, but it was a lengthy time. I was awake for a long period of time, and um, uh, there were things that I needed to do of a spiritual nature even after those long periods of time, and I can remember feeling energized yeah. um, uh, in an unusual way to do that. Um, so... Gary, if, asked that, if that happens again, would you take me along so I can watch you? <laughs> well, Gary, Gary asks about this, any, any examples from scripture or even in modern times? Probably the example I would quote would be the, day, the example of Abraham on his way to Mount Moriah with Isaac. He didn't, Ellen White says he didn't sleep for three nights. He would walk all day and he would pray all night, he would walk all day, he would pray all night, he would walk all day, he would pray all night. And he was ready for the experience of Mount Moriah after those three nights. Of course, there's some people that have so much stress that they can't sleep, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, what he, that's how you could explain that, but you and might they, be right. You might function. be right. They don't function yeah. well. well. They make bad decisions, bad choices. Yeah. Well, the 144,000 have that experience in prayer before yeah. they're energized for their duty. When Jesus prayed to the Father, was the Holy Spirit present? Mm -hmm. Isn't he omnipresent? think so. Did Jesus feel like he was meeting with his best friends? 
Did the Holy Spirit have to do that groaning for Jesus? Whatever that means. I, I, I'm, I'm sure we don't know what that means. He's translating it into heaven's language, maybe. I think to get back to Gary's question, there's a difference between Christ at that time. He'd had probably, I'm guessing, two-thirds, three-quarters of his lifetime as an as a active prayer person. The disciples probably, at the very least, weren't. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure after the crucifixion, Peter and James and John, the picture changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, Ken, I, in response to the necess necessity for mm -hmm. this, where it talks about the Holy Spirit um, um, pleading for us and so on and so forth, I, I've come to some, I'm just contributing this here. I don't know if it's true or not, but... I've come to some conclusions that helped me with that, um, and, and I, I've come to the conclusion that all my, every prayer I pray, the answer is always yes. Mm. And and um, the reason for that is, even though it may come back and I don't think it's answered, um, I'm I'm asking for things fr from deep within me. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for things, and. In my, in my lack of understanding, I'm asking for these things to be fulfilled in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But God knows that if what I really want is fulfilled, it's going to be answered some other way. Mm -hmm. I, the specific thing here is that's not the correct way for it to be answered. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess I think I've learned this in my life. And so... Um, uh, things have, have, when I've asked specifically sometimes, those specific things haven't been answered. But in time, sometimes, I guess maybe even years later, I've realized as I've been able to look back, you know, I really got what I wanted as I look here, but it, it wasn't answered like that. And God knew if He'd have given me that, it wouldn't have been answered. Like that, and some I, I, I used this illustration before. In you know, we, I, I'm a participant in the Word Pictures broadcast, and it, it dawned on me one day when I was um, I was doing some house cleaning, and there was a, a vase uh, with a rose on it on the on my dining table, and I went to dust that off, and when I raised the vase off, why it, there was a dust ring there where the vase had been, and the dust had settled, and. I don't know why it occurred to me this way, and I won't take too much time of our, of our lesson here, but it, it dawned on me, it seemed to be that this was an example much of uh, my prayer life, is that I would ask for something, and then I often forget what I've asked for, and then later in life, it's like I come across it, all of a sudden there's this vase with this beautiful rose right here, and I, I lift it off and it's been there all the way, all this time, and I didn't even realize it, and suddenly I've realized yeah. it, and somehow I think, I think that's the way, you know, if, if you pray for something specific and it doesn't happen, well, then you kind of stomp off. But if you just have enough faith and have your eyes open a little bit, sometimes it comes through that mm. this is really the way. And so when it talks about the Holy Spirit interpreting our prayers for us, I don't understand why that would need to be, but I think I understand that concept is that you know, I'm asking for things that I don't, it really ought to be interpreted in another way. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're, what you're talking about is kind of a more mature look at prayer. <clears throat> now, I did some time working in Pathfinders where you had a bunch of little kids there <laughs> losing stuff, and they get together and pray about it, and lo and behold, they'd find it. There was one, one little girl that lost her key, a little tiny key, out in the middle of a play field. It must have been about, I don't know, 20 acres. And she says, I gotta have this key, I gotta have this key. So they all, let, they by themselves, they, they settled down and they prayed about it. And they just went out there to look at for it. And I says, Oh my, this is really something, you know. And sure enough, they found it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it's, it's just like yeah. they're in the age where God yeah. really 
goes and answers the prayer because they're asking if God's really there, you know, and it really happens. But then I, I started thinking that maybe we're not like children in our prayer life, you know, that he doesn't answer like that anymore. But now since I've gotten older, I think it is because they're young, you know, and the prayer, their prayer, specific prayers do get answered more than maybe an older person would because they have to learn to adjust around God. You, you, do you think God with his foreknowledge in those night sessions with Jesus would say, beware, this is where Satan's going to attack you tomorrow. This is what he's going to do tomorrow. This is what he's going to do. Did he tell Jesus? Huh? Well, he ma Jesus made a good point in, to um, make sure that he was not surprised at anything. Mm -hmm. It seemed like. I mean, he was never surprised at anything. He, even, he had it all planned out. Wouldn't well, it give Jesus an edge that we don't get? I mean, that's, that's well, a sort of a no man's land, that one. Ellen White says that Jesus had no experiences that we couldn't have if we had the same relationship. But then I think somewhere, and we've talked about this before, he was exposed to the scriptures as he had them then mm -hmm. at a very early age mm -hmm. and obviously absorbed it very well, which a lot of us didn't do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Hebrews 11.6 would give us some clues. Look at Hebrews 11.6. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God, now that would not be talking about prayer, whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists. You wouldn't pray to him unless you believe he existed, right? And rewards those who seek him. Well, I think there were, I think there were classic people, Old Testament um, groups of people, they worshipped anything that came along. Mm -hmm. And so they would worship God, quotes, worship God, because, you know, he seemed to be a big God and they could he would answer some things too. But I don't think it's quite like what, what uh, the author of Hebrews there is uh, driving at. Okay. Well, I don't think we would pray to God unless he believed he existed. So is there a question about whether he can actually do it? Or whether he's willing to do it? And does, does, our, does his answers to our prayers, does that impact our faith? Uh, I think it could, but not necessarily immediate. Sometimes it's down the way a bit. Yeah. Ellen White said specifically, our prayers, I'm quoting, our prayers will take the form now, this would suggest that this is an ideal prayer, I'm, I'm assuming. Our prayers will take the form of a conversation with God as we would talk with a friend. Now, here's, here's a, an example I, I can put for you. Suppose every night all we did was kneel down and said, God, tomorrow I need this and this and this and this. And this. Thank you very much. Good night. Um, how, would the, how long would that relationship or how would that relationship grow? Suppose that uh, you're a young man and you're dating a young lady and you really want to get her attention and you really want to make progress in this relationship and you say, you know what I really want is that, and thank you for listening to me, bye. Uh, I don't think that would work too well. <laughs> you don't think that would work too well? <laughs> but we seem to think it'll work with God. Depends on how desperate the female is. <laughs> well, I don't, think, I don't think we can put God in the desperate category. That quotation, by the way, is Christ's Object Lessons, page 129.3. But if God knows, I mean, clearly Matthew 6, 8 says, God knows everything. He knows the hairs on our head, etc. He knows everything we're going to pray about before we even pray it. So what's the point? Why does God want us to pray? If he already knows us and knows what we need, why does he want us to pray? If this is a conversation between friends, what does that imply? Maybe God knows us. We need to know him a little better. Yeah. It's a conversation. Remember my question back at the beginning, is prayer to change God or is it to change the world or is it to change us? God already does for us what we need. It's just not what we want. 
<laughs> okay. So then we don't need to pray for things that we think we, we need. Really need. No want. Things we want. <laughs> if, if prayer, if Bible study is related to prayer in some way, we said the three things that Christians are supposed to know about is Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. If Bible study is related to prayer, wouldn't the very best prayers happen maybe before and after we spend time studying the Bible? Have you ever had the experience of discovering something from the Bible or perhaps from the writings of Ellen White that just says, you say, yes! That is wonderful. I'm so excited. I, this is a new point. And of course, you might have found out that you already underlined it 10 times, you know. <laughs> Every time you come across it, it's exciting. But nevertheless, I, I often listen to the Ellen White or the Bible, either, for that matter as well, on my MP3 player as I'm running early in the morning, often in the dark. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll hear something that's really exciting and I'm jumping up and down on the trails and the in the dust and the dirt out there in the mountain, in the hills, and I'm sure people would think I was crazy if they just saw me. <laughs> but um, if we learn how to pray correctly, would that be a means of helping us to empty ourselves of self? I think you could develop the capacity. Mm -hmm. It's got to be exercised. Luke 9.23 talks about dying daily. Think that would have anything to do with prayer? See that? That's one reason why a lot of people don't want to pray too much, is because that's, <laughs> that's part of the prayer thing. <laughs> well, the Bible seems to talk about it like it's a good thing. Calling all this change. Yeah. Who wants to change? Would we gradually change from trying to always get things to go our way to trying to do things God's way? Only when we know God and trust Him. And I think we get that from reading the Bible. There's some very interesting verses found in, the, in Daniel chapter 9. I'd like to read a few of them. Look at Daniel 9, and let's start with verse 3. Daniel 9, verse 3. And I prayed earnestly to the Lord God, pleading with him, fasting, wearing sackcloth, and sitting in ashes. Now this is pretty intense, right? I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed the sins of my people. I said, Lord God, you are great and we honor you. You're faithful to your covenant and show constant love to those who love you and do what you command. Now, he goes on and on. I'm, we don't have time to read the whole prayer, which I would encourage you to do, but I'm going to drop down really to verse 15. O oh Lord our God, you showed your power by bringing your people out of Egypt, and your power is still remembered. We have sinned. We have done wrong then you have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with Jerusalem any longer. It is your city, your sacred hill. What's he trying to say here? Your reputation, God. God, this is your reputation we're talking about here. All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your people because of our sins and the evil our ancestors did. He's not trying to blame somebody else. He's saying we did it. It's our fault. No question about that. O oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, O oh God. Look at us and see the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you're merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are our God, do not delay. This city and these people are yours. Now, is that the prayer we should be praying as the Laodicean church? Well, what about that? Well, I was going to ask something similar. Is that the prayer I ought to be praying just as a person? Mm -hmm. And then the next question was, is this the kind of prayer I ought to get up and something of this flavor? Mm -hmm. Next time I'm asked to offer Prayer for the congregation and church. Get up and pray something like this. It We're would be very appropriate, I think. Yeah. So, so what was the point that you're getting at for even reading that part? Well, the point I'm getting at is, here's Daniel. He's one of God's best friends. He's been through some incredible experiences uh, his whole life. He list, missed out on the marriage experience. He was probably made a eunuch when he was very young, a teenager. He's served 
foreign, go uh, foreign uh, governments for his whole life, basically. And now he says, God, the 70 years are over. It's time for you to do something for your name. And I, I care about what people think about you. So not not happening? God come and do do what I want. You know, I, I, I'm having a bad time right now. Couldn't you please give me a higher salary or whatever? No, God, I care about what's happening to your reputation. And God acted. But what's, what's being accomplished with this prayer? Is that just, just that he's worried about God? Mm -hmm. You know what I, he, I he think cares about He cares about his friend's reputation. That's what's important about that prayer. It's almost though that he's... he's crying out his will too mm -hmm. that God fulfill his promise mm -hmm. because because there's almost a, a, a problem here maybe Satan is saying those guys don't really want to restore the temple yeah you know and how is that going to be proven that they do want to want the temple restored well if God holds back and they keep Praying, they keep praying, they keep praying. That's showing that their will is for God to restore this temple. So there's there's times where but, I really think that you have to show that you want your will is to have God's will fulfilled. Yeah, it, but the point is, the point is not, well, and, and I think you've said it, but maybe in a slightly different way. We need to be concerned about God's reputation in the world have we smeared god's reputation oh. have we have we have we helped god look good by delaying his coming 167 years mm -hmm. or whatever i mean you know seriously i'm an embarrassment every day <laughs> but see the the point well, the point i'm getting at is what would have happened if god just sent some people over there and it just happened you know satan would just say well you did it you're the one that wanted it done. I mean, there's no, nobody really wanted it done. You just did it. But now he's proving that somebody is really want that to happen sure. besides God. Mm -hmm. There's people there that want it to happen. It isn't because yeah. God just wants it to happen. So James 4, 2 and Luke 11, 9 and 10, just to, to pick a couple examples, say we need to plead, we need to ask, we need to seek, we need to knock. And James 5, 16 to 18 says, if you're a righteous person, the effective, you know, a fervent prayer of a righteous person has a powerful effect. Much. Yeah, Elijah prayed, and I, I, I wonder about this. Our Bible study guide suggests Elijah prayed and the rain stopped. And three and a half years later, or however long it was, Elijah prayed again and the rain started. I'm wondering, do you think that was Elijah's idea? I don't think so. I think God was uh, directing that whole thing. There's probably more to the story that's not in there. Yeah. <laughs> and and we know from the record that Daniel, getting back to Daniel, he spent a lifetime of praying. They tried yeah. to get at him over this. Yep. And he was intimate with God in ways that I'm sure none of us have ever been. Yeah. Now, well, the, the interesting thing about Elijah, um, he went up to the king and he says, it will not rain not till God says so? No, till I say so. Yep. So, because, there's because a point that there. Because didn't recognize, he wasn't recognizing anything from God. Well, I, what difference would it make? I mean, if he, even if he said, you know, yeah. until God says so, well then, you how know. How would God say so? How would he say, well, when it started raining, or when it didn't stop, when it didn't rain. That's how he says it. Well. But he says, when I say so it's almost like God is following Elijah there. Well, but I, I think I think the application there would be <clears throat> be very much like Moses. You know, the 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 water turned to blood when he stuck his staff in there, but he was instructed to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I don't, I'd have to read back into the story of Elijah here to find out if there was you know that kind of instruction, but. I'm I'm under the inclination that God told Elijah to go yeah. down there and say, mm -hmm. you know, this is what's going to happen when you tell him, that, you know. But you and can't the, prove it. Well, when the rain you know, maybe if I look again, again, he sent his servant after I it rained several mm -hmm. times. So there was... Yeah, he kept, when it was time for the rain to start again, he said seven times, go out and look, go out and look, go out and look, go out and look, and so forth and so forth. And finally, the seventh time, he says, it's a tiny little cloud. 
Well, I just said that's, that's all we need. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Now I have a question. Why was there sackcloth and ashes? Is that something we should think about today? That, that's a cultural thing cultural. from ancient times. That's the way they exhibited their, their sorrow for what was happening. What would be the equivalent today? They it was a case of humility, bowing low before God. They seem to do, there seemed to be a lot of that. Uh, um, um, Ezekiel was told to go and do certain things, and Jose, well, was it Hosea that was uh, uh, told to marry the, the prostitute, and so on and so forth. There seemed to be something in the culture where they actually acted out certain things for some reason or other. Well, there's very interesting verse found in Genesis 18. Look at Genesis 18. Now, you remember, this is a story of how God showed up one day and was talking to... He looked like just three strangers walking along, and Abraham rushed out and said, Come in, come in, come in, let me give you something. Can I feed you, etc., etc. And finally, he finds out that... Um, Abraham finds out that this is God that's come, along with a couple of angels. And the angels finally leave, and here's, Ab here's Abraham talking with his friend God. And um, I'm going to jump down to verse 25. Surely, this is Abraham speaking to God. Remember, Abraham was one of the very, very few people, I think there's maybe two people in the Bible who are described as friends of God, and he, Abraham was one of them. He says, he says to God, surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. That's impossible. You can't do that. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. That is impossible. The judge of all the earth has to act justly. When was the last time you said to God, you got to do what's right? Well, if you're going to play that card, you better make sure that what you're asking <laughs> You better. Is the right <laughs> card. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, look at Second Chronicles 7.14. Does God yeah. like that type of prayer, or does God Well, he not... certainly called Abraham his friend. <clears throat> and he kept calling Abraham his friend all the way till New Testament times. James calls Abraham God's friend. Well, look at Second Chronicles 7.14. If they pray to me and repent and turn away from the evil they have been doing, then I will hear them in heaven, forgive their sins, and make their land prosperous again. What does that tell us about prayer? Requires some action on our part. Action and what else? Follow up. Follow up? To repent. Repenting? Mm -hmm. How do we humbly seek after God? And I argue with God. Yeah. Well, do you argue with your friends? Let me ask that first. Well, I argue with some of you. <laughs> 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 well, I say, what about this? What about that? Is that okay? If we humbly sought God, really, as a church, would there be a cleansing from sin? Does this verse imply that God does not answer our prayers when we are misbehaving and that he cannot? How many of us stop sinning before we pray so that God can answer us? I've tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> Do well, we there's need to... also the prayer uh, asking God to help us stop our sinning. Yes. Well, here's a scary thought. This is Ellen White again, Steps to Christ, page 95. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin, the Lord will not hear us. But the prayer of the penitent, contrite soul is always accepted. When all known wrongs are righted, if we, all known, if we righted all known wrongs in our lives, we may believe that God will answer our petitions. Our own merit will never com commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us, His blood that will cleanse us. Yet we have a work to do in complying with the conditions of acceptance. Now how in the world are we going to get all that stuff corrected? Yeah. We can't right all wrongs. We need to read the rest of the chapter. <laughs> Keep reading, huh? Keep reading, yeah. <laughs> you got to at least attempt to, huh? 
Well, does this quotation suggest that the major reason why our prayers are not answered is that we come to God as sinners? Can we come to God any other way? No. Do we have the wrong attitude? So how does that compare with the other paragraph you just read? You've got to have things all straightened up before you. So then, why? Well, at least you're not as much a sinner. Yeah, you get everything straightened up, maybe you don't need to pray. How, much, how less of a sinner do you have to be? Yeah. And we're not wise enough, enough to know even what straightened up is. Yeah. Well, Something about those paragraphs don't seem to match up. They're, all, they're one after the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about this from the Bible? I'm reading from Hebrews 10, verse 38. My righteous people, however, will believe and live. But if any of them turns back, I will not be pleased with him. What does it mean, turn back? Well, it sounds not like he's turning back into sin. Oh, okay. Change of direction. Well, let me try one more. Let's try uh, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. So if you're not obeying all the commandments, that means you don't love God. Is that true? It's what it says. <laughs> what do we do with these verses? What does it mean to search for God with all your heart, to forget self and take up your cross? Is that something that's comfortable for us to do as human beings? See, that's why we don't pray as much as we should, because it's got all that other stuff in there that you have to end up doing, taking up your cross and getting things all straightened, straightened out. out. Yeah. And when you, you know, when you're not an experienced Christian, you don't know all that, so you feel comfortable going in there. I see. But when you know all of that, then, my goodness, who wants to go into that? It's a growth process. Uh -huh. Well, you know, what a child prays is different to what we pray or it should be. Mm -hmm. And I think God understands the different levels of the, the, the gravity of the composition of the prayer. Mm -hmm. Can we actually be transformed from selfish human beings into loving and kind disciples of Jesus through our own power? No. No. How do we actually become like Je more like Jesus? Well, you behold him. Mm -hmm. him Great Controversy, page 555, is just one of those places where Ellen White says, by beholding, we become changed. You know, if, you're, if your child was in trouble with drugs or something, um, bad group of people, you would not want him to straighten up before he came and talked to you. No. And even if he failed again and again, you would want him to come and talk to you mm -hmm. as much as it took for him to um, understand he was destroying himself. And um, so anyway, I, I don't think we need to be perfect in order to come to God. It's kind of a reckless, you, you, there's kind of a reckless um, um, attitude that I think the, the Bible is talking about too as far as um, approaching God when you're not careful about what you're doing you're not careful to know what God stands for but you just come in and ask him for mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. type of thing so I think there's that side too that has to be dealt with yeah. and that's what it's talking about well um, in light of the great controversy what's the role of prayer are there prayers which God cannot answer because of the great controversy? Are there prayers that he's able to answer because of the great controversy? Do we always pray in light of what we know about the great controversy? Do we recognize that Satan is active, alive and well, roar, going about as a roaring lion on our earth? Well, some examples of the Bible. If you were to pick out your favorite prayer in the Bible, what would it be? A lot of people would pick the Lord's Prayer, I'm sure. Lord forgive them, they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. Good one. There's a pretty wide breadth of beyond yeah. what he was saying it right then. 
the, the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 is pretty impressive. Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple was so impressive that, you know, God's glory came down and filled the temple. The priests couldn't even go in. In fact, that had happened earlier, uh, Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35, when the tabernacle, the tent, out in the, in the desert was dedicated. And yet God says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, that the temple that was built later, where there was none of that glory stuff, would be more glorious than the former two. How could that be true? One's more sensational and the other one's more to the truth. Well, Jesus would be in the second one. Yeah. This, well, really the third one we're talking well, about, Herod's. the second temple, Herod's temple. Jesus would come and God's idea of what's really important, Jesus would come and he would arrive early in the morning in the temple and he would sit down in a corner of one of those porticos, one of those areas, and people would crowd around him to hear what he had to say. And God's idea, what was really exciting for God, was to see all those people eagerly trying to learn what the truth is. What does that teach us about prayer? Are we eagerly trying to find out what the truth is? Jesus, it seems, probably had planned every day of his life with the Father. There were times when he didn't bother to stop and pray. You know, in the case of Lazarus, when he rose him, when he raised him from the dead, he said, Father, I pray and, you know, let these people see, etc. But sometimes, like in the case of the paralytic, he said, your sins are forgiven. And in other cases, uh, out there, on the, out there on, the, on the water, when the storm was on, and the fishermen were sure they were going to die, Jesus stood up and said, Peace be still. He didn't say, God, is it all right if we do this? He said, peace be still, and the water was <coughs> like that. That's a, those are pretty impressive things. And we're told that Jesus didn't do things, never did use God's power, his own power, for his own benefit. And yet, look at all these things he did. We could have much of that same experience if we had that kind of open and close relationship with God. How can we get it? Well, certainly prayer is one of the ways. The final group here on this earth, the 144,000, are going to have that kind of a relationship. Well, the devil shows up and faces them right in front of their face. They're going to be able to say, you're wrong. The truth I know is different than that. Pray that every one of us may be a part of that group. See you next week.